Good morning, everyone. We are so grateful to welcome Rob to connect with the McAllister community today via Zoom. Um, Rob is the training director with Literacy Minnesota, where he oversees the training of volunteer literacy tutors working with adults and kids. As a bit of background, Rob began his involvement with Literacy Minnesota as a volunteer tutor back in 1986 and he has been coordinating tutor training since 1991. Over the years, he's led hundreds of workshops and trained thousands of individuals. We've been working with him at McAllister as far back as I can recall, which covers at least the last 18 or 19 years. And I am so grateful when he enthusiastically responded to our request <laughs> to transition his in-person ABCs of reading training to our current online reality. Um, I also want to briefly express my profound gratitude to Matt from the Dean's Office of the IGC, who is rescuing us from most certain doom via Zoom, given my lack of technological expertise. Matt will be making all of this newfangled technology work for us today, and I encourage you to connect with him via the chat function if you are experiencing any technological challenges. Please go ahead and chat Matt Katsaros. Um, also, please note that today's gathering is being recorded so that it may be viewed at a later date as we anticipate having tutors join us at McAllister over the course of this fall. With that, I will turn things over to Rob. Thank you. All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Ruth. That was a, a good introduction. History I didn't know I had, so thank you for that. Uh, as Ruth said, my name is Rob Pulasic, and I'm the training director. I used to be training director for the Minnesota Literacy Council, and on January 1st, we changed our name to Literacy Minnesota, and we fully expected that to be the most exciting thing to happen in 2020. And here we are in September, and it's not even the top 20 most exciting things to happen. Uh, most profound of all, the movement of all of our instruction to virtual, and then all of our tutor training to virtual. So it's a new reality for all of us, and it's exciting and nerve wracking, and it is what it is. I just want to thank you all for doing the work that you're doing with the kids. I know how important tutoring is for them. It's been that way since the beginning of time, and this year is no different. So thank you for that work. Uh, thank you for doing it this year when there's a lot of unknowns. And so in advance, I want to thank you for all of the ambiguity that you'll be dealing with. Um, people haven't been doing this for 20 years. They've been doing it for a couple months. And so there's going to a lot of, be a lot of questions about how this is going to work and what you should do. And so thank you for tolerating that and rising to that challenge. And then I really want to encourage you to document what you do and share what you do because virtual learning isn't going away. Virtual tutoring isn't going away. And you guys are the pioneers this year in figuring out how it's going to work. And so the experiences that you've had and the expertise that you could share are really going to enrich years and years and years into the future. So please share that information with Ruth and Eileen and all of the staff in terms of what worked, what didn't work. So our agenda for the hour and a half we have today, pretty ambitious. Uh, this is the welcome. We're going to do a little reading overview, looking at the reading process, what it is, and why kids sometimes struggle. We'll spend time talking about reading to kids and reading with kids, probably the most common thing that tutors do, and research suggests the most valuable thing tutors do. Uh, we'll talk about helping kids understand vocabulary words. A big part of what you'll be doing is explaining unknown words to the kids. So we'll talk about strategies for doing that well. Uh, we'll touch briefly on alphabetics, which is probably the thing that's changed most in the um, virtual environment. And then we'll end with what teachers said was the most valuable thing volunteers could work on, and that is writing. So we'll give you six suggestions for some writing activities. So that is the plan. Uh, we're going to do a lot of breakout room work, and we're going to do a lot of type your answers in the chat box work, and it'll really help if you have a couple pieces of scratch paper around to uh, jot some things down. So that's the plan. So we're going to start out with a warm-up, and I know no two words and still fear in people, then warm-up. It's like, oh my gosh, bad enough I have to be here. Now the little weenie is going to make us do something, but... Are going to do warm up activity, and this is a great activity to do with the kids. 
and it's called a story chain or a cooperation. What we're gonna do is in a couple seconds, we're gonna put you in breakout rooms and uh, we'll have about six people in each room. And uh, if you could turn on your camera and mic so you can see and hear each other. Introduce yourselves in terms of where you are, what you're doing, what your major is, all that good stuff. And then you need to pick a starter. So we're gonna say the person who was born farthest away from McAllister gets to go first. So figure out who that is. And then once you've done that, you're gonna do the activities. So the starter is gonna start with a story starter like it was a dark and stormy night or once upon a time or after I was evacuated from Liechtenstein because of COVID or last night when I should have been studying or however you wanna start the story. And then you're gonna go around the room Person's going to share, uh, uh, use a sentence, and they're going to call on someone who will continue the story with a sentence or two. And then that person will call on someone who will continue the story with a sentence or two, and so forth. And I'd like you to continue until we call you back into the main room. And if you run out of this, your end your story, go ahead and start another story. Okay. So I'll have Matt go ahead and put people in the breakout rooms, and we'll do 10 minutes for this activity. See you in 10 minutes. So my question is, uh, what's the point of an activity that like that? What would a kid be doing, practicing learning, doing by doing a cooperation story or a story chain? So just go ahead and type in the chat box sort of what is the purpose of doing an activity like the story chain activity you just tried. Normalizing silliness, that's great. Working as a team, imagination, creativity, thinking, building off each other, sharing, that social emotional connection that you're making with the kids, which is probably the most important thing, that unity, making that connection. So a lot of great reasons to do the activity. Um, biggest one, it, uh, helps kids build their oral language skills. And there's so much emphasis on reading and writing, you know, getting the kids reading and writing younger and younger. And that's important, but we sometimes forget that successful reading and writing instruction is based upon this foundation of listening and speaking. And research says the average kid, whoever that is, gets to kindergarten knowing about 10,000 words in English. And that's what we build reading instruction on, the assumption or the presumption that they have that oral language background. And we know that's tr not true. Kids come in not with 10,000 words, but maybe 8,000 words, 6,000 words. If English isn't the language they're using at home, then they might only have 500 words in English. One of the biggest things that you can do as a tutor is look for opportunities to let the kids practice their oral language skills. This is probably message number one I get from the schools all the time when I say, what should I tell tutors? It's let the kids practice talking because during the normal school day, they don't always get a chance to talk. You know, the teachers are like, um, you know, there's 30 of you, sit still and do your worksheet. Parents are often busy, so they don't have the opportunity to let the kids talk. But you guys as tutors, you only have one or two kids to work with at a time. You don't have to worry with all kinds of other distractions. So great opportunity to let the kids practice their oral language skills. And um, you guys have an added advantage and that is you have a whole lot of cool points. So who, does the, who do the kids wanna talk to? Uh, it's you guys, because as college students, you are so ridiculously awesome. And um, you guys just walk in with all these cool points. I have to work really hard to earn cool points some pictures here of my desperate attempts to be cool. Dressed up as a ninja turtle, got me some cool points. Dressed as a pirate, that got me some cool points. Dressed up as a crayon, that just kind of scared the kids, but um, <laughs> great opportunity for you guys to, uh, to talk with the kids because they really want to talk with you. They want to learn what a college student is like, and so look for every opportunity you can to uh, talk with the kids.
I will send out, uh, I'll send to uh, Ruth a, a packet of materials and she can forward it to you. But I just have this list of ways volunteers can help kids learn to read and write. And the top, top one is talk. Talk about the weather, talk about the weekend, talk about the story before you write it, after you write it, talk about the book before you read it, after you read it. Again, just let them practice those oral language skills. And you can do that in person, but you can certainly do it online as well. And again, I'll send this out to you so you don't have to read through it right now. And then I have this cartoon, Read. I only learned to talk four years ago. You know, when you think about it, what a kid learns to do language-wise in the first few year of, years of their life is really pretty incredible. So it's cool to get to be part of that. So we're gonna do a little background information on reading and First thing I'd like you to do, and you can do this in the chat box, I won't put you back into breakout rooms, is uh, I would like you to generate a definition of reading. So in the chat box, write a sentence or some terms just to define reading. What is reading? So see what people come up with. Interpreting and understand written language. Uh, poetic, traveling in a world of imagination, understanding written language, interpret written language, converting symbols into meaning, meaning through words, translating words to meaning, telling of stories for different perspectives, gaining new knowledge, that's cool. Finding your own meaning for groups of words. Anything else in terms of definition of reading? All right, well, here's the one I'm gonna share. Decoding symbols in order to understand the message in order to do something. So decoding symbols in order to understand the message in order to do something. And I think in your definitions, you uh, mentioned each of these points. I just tied them all together. You guys were much more poetic with your language. And I use three colors to get across the idea. It's a three-part definition, three-part process. And when helping kids or helping anybody with reading, you gotta keep all three parts in mind because sometimes we focus on one, forget about the others. Uh, first part, decoding symbols. Uh, making sense of the marks on the page, not something you're born knowing, it's something you need to be taught. Big part of reading instruction, especially at the lowest levels, teaching strategies for decoding, learning the letters, sounding out words, memorizing words, really important. And the research continues to come back to its importance and how it's something that we need to explicitly be taught because it's not something you pick up automatically. And sometimes people stop there, they say that's what reading is, reading is decoding. And you all took it to that second level, which is meaning or comprehension or understanding. And I'll have people say, well, you can read without understanding. And I'll argue, no, you can decode without understanding. But uh, until you can understand, until there's comprehension, you can't really call it reading. And it's kind of a waste of time. And then the third part, part in blue, is the purpose. Reading is a tool. It's a means to an end. And the reason we have all these literacy programs is because it's a really important tool in our culture. And we really don't read because it's fun sounding out short vowel songs, right? We learn to read, to do something. Um, trying to go back to the uh, one from Anna or Anna, uh, traveling in a world of imagination, which is a very beautiful purpose. So uh, think about why you read, think about the reasons why the kids read, and sort of make sure that you help them understand that there is a purpose. Because um, what I find is the kids are like, ah, I hate to read, nobody else likes to read. And so of course, share uh, why you read, what you read. Uh, share the fact that you read stuff that you might not necessarily want to, but because you want to get your education, get your degree, get your grade, uh, you do what you have to do. So share that with them. 
All right, I'm gonna have you do some reading. So I'm gonna put a passage on the screen and it's a couple paragraphs along with some comprehension questions. And I'm gonna give you about six minutes to do some directed silent reading. So go ahead, read through it and answer the questions and then I'll have you share out the questions in a little bit. So there's the passage. And I'll give you six minutes, go ahead, read through, answer the questions. Uh, this might be, is it supposed to be backwards? It is supposed to be backwards, yep. So oh. make, you, make you struggle a little bit. And I'll give you four more minutes. Got two minutes. Thirty seconds.
five seconds. And I'll call time. And could I get somebody who would be willing to turn on their mic and read this out loud for us? Earn some extra humanitarian points, press your peers, help me out. Someone help me out, come on. I'll do it. All right, Emily, yeah. thank you, thank you. Do I have to read the whole thing? Yeah, all two paragraphs, yep. Okay. Um, a trog starts granning a steg as soon as it is born. It never stops granning. Um, Stags. The the stag catches um, glad for the the trog. The stag is very strong. The stag can hold or or its and even little animals like mice. A trog can bird uh, blugs um, together. The blug, bl blugs are in the water. The trog gets on the blugs and sails off, sails off. The trog may get off his blug boat and walk on the water or catch an uh, or it. Then he gets back on his blug boat and sails away. Beautiful. Thank you so much for helping me out. Uh, better check comprehension. So I'll go have you guys uh, enter, enter your answers in the chat box. So we'll start number one. Number one, a tra grand stags, A, all its life, B, now and then, C, once a year. Lots of A's popping up. Next one, what are two things a stag can catch? Two things a stag can catch. Bob and mice. All right, good. Number three, a stake is never broken. True, false, does not say. Lots of does not say, and does not say questions are tough. So it's, it's hard to find something that's not there. So good job with that. Uh, number four, what can a trog bind together? A blugs, B or it's C glob. All right, good. And number five, a trog can walk in water. True, false, does not say. Correct. So you read it beautifully. You got uh, all the answers correct. You're obviously great students. I'm obviously an amazing teacher. What's the problem? Uh, none of us know what's going on. <laughs> none of you know what's going on. That is indeed a problem. And if you remember nothing else about this training, that's a definite possibility. Remember this activity. And every time the kid you're working with reads something as beautifully as Emily did, stop and think. Is that like that Trog's activity? And every time they get all the questions right, just like you did, stop and think, is that like the drugs activity? Because you'll see this replicated over and over again. And usually most kids aren't going to say, excuse me, I don't have a clue. They're going to say, man, that sucked. Let's do something else. So obviously an activity to give you an idea of some of the struggles, some of the feelings the kids might face. 
How are you feeling as you did this? Go ahead, type your answers in the chat box. How are you feeling? Sad, confused, frustrated, frustrated. Lack of motivation, gave up. I'm sure a lot of you gave up. Physically, your head hurt. We forget that reading is a physical activity. Felt dumb. Yeah, so remember those feelings of frustration. You know, you have felt them here five minutes in a training. The kids face it all the time. And so um, it gets frustrating for the kids. And sometimes we're oblivious to it. We're like, isn't this fun? And we forget that it's a struggle, physically a struggle, mentally a struggle for the kids. So what were some of the reading challenges you had? What made this difficult for you? Go ahead and type in your chat box. Unfamiliar vocabulary, the tracking just going from left to right. The writing looked different. Not knowing if the words were real, of course they're real. Words you didn't know. Yeah, again, that unfamiliar vocabulary. Yeah, so a whole laundry list of problems. Uh, first, reading from left to right, or excuse me, from right to left, which isn't natural, but neither is reading from left to right. Uh, that tracking is a learned skill. And you'll see kids who get lost. You're like, pay attention. It's like, I am paying attention, just don't know um, what, uh, which direction to go. Uh, Emily made some reversals. She made Bs into Ds and uh, Ws into Ms. Okay. Just a glob for glod uh, or vice versa. That's pretty common too. Uh, kids will often make reversals. Sometimes it's a sign of a learning disability. Other times it's just the fact that uh, it really, you know, if you think about having a dog in real life, it doesn't matter which direction you turn that dog, it's still a dog. It doesn't work that way with letters. And so kids don't see that a B in, the direction of a B and B make a difference. Okay. Uh, the vocabulary, a huge piece. Uh, there were about six unknown words. So you knew the vast majority of the words, uh, but you know, if you don't know the title, it's gonna be a bad reading assignment, right? So just a few unknown words really throw off the kids. Okay. Uh, a couple of you gave up. We'll go back. That definition of reading. Where in this definition were you, were you spending your energy? Which part? Decoding symbols, understanding, or the application? Where were you using your brain cells? Decoding. Yep. Yeah, I think decoding always wins out over comprehension. So if you're sitting there, the kids sitting there trying to figure out if that's a B or a D, they're probably not having a lot of brain cells left over for comprehension and they're definitely not gonna be using this information anywhere. So remember decoding wins out over everything else. All right, great. Thank you for getting frustrated. It's uh, hard to frustrate college students. It's easy to say, ah, just one more pointless piece of crap I have to read, but thank you for playing along and getting frustrated for me. So you have some idea of what the kids are facing. So now with the remaining time, I wanna talk about strategies that you can use for helping the kids. And uh, we'll talk about these in general, how these will play out in the virtual environment will really vary from situation to situation. And again, you guys are the pioneers in terms of figuring out how this is gonna work logistically, but uh, the concepts apply everywhere. Get the screen to move. Just quickly, I wanna talk about five components of reading that when we read, there are five things that we have to master. The first is phonological awareness, meaning we have to be able to hear and produce and manipulate the sounds. And kids usually spend the first few years of their life doing that as they learn to hear the language and speak the language. Then there's alphabetics, which is tying the sounds in our language to the symbols. And we have a challenge there because we have 26 letters and about 47 sounds, so not an equal sound symbol relationship. 
fluency, which is able to read quickly and easily and with expression. Vocabulary, knowing what the words are. And then comprehension, which is the granddaddy of them all. The whole point of the first four is to get the comprehension, but then having comprehension skills is its own area, like finding the main idea is a comprehension skill that's not part of the other five. The other four. So these are the big five, and we'll talk quite a bit about fluency and vocabulary today. So in terms of activities, common things we do as tutors is read to them or read with them. And there are lots of great reasons to do that. And virtually or in person, this will probably be a big part of what you're doing. And uh, when we think of these, we think of, you know, obviously you read to the kid or the kid reads to you, and those are big strategies. But we also have uh, three sort of intermediate strategies that bridge the two. And so we'll talk about uh, these five activities and how you might do them with the We'll start with reading to the kids. Very common activity. You read out loud to the kids. When you're in person, you do it in person. Certainly via Zoom or other online platform, you'll be doing it virtually. So other than ice cream, which is clearly a big benefit for uh, these kids. What are the benefits of reading out loud to a kid? How does this help them become a better reader? Go ahead and type in the chat box. They hear a word sound. They build vocabulary, which is huge. They hear your pronunciation, hear expression. Builds that phonological awareness. They hear the inflections. They hear what natural reading sounds like, which is different than when you read trogs. Sorry, Emily. I think you've got them. I have a, a few here I want to talk about. Uh, develops print awareness, which is a big one, especially if you're reading with uh, really little kids. You know, if you, you have an eight-month-old, a book, and a truck, she's going to do pretty much the same thing with it, which is put it in his or her mouth. Okay. Then uh, once, you know, they get to develop some print awareness, they realize that books and trucks aren't the same thing. And so they move from this level of print awareness so this level of print awareness where they're getting better at the understanding how books work. And then they move from this level to here where it's clear a SAT there understands how books work. So with really young kids, one of the biggest things you can do is read to them so that they see what the reading looks like. And we unfortunately see kids who come to our preschool who don't know what books are because they've really never seen somebody use one. So building that print awareness is huge. Uh, models fluent reading. If you want to be a good piano player, you listen to good piano players. If you want to be a good soccer player, you listen to good soccer or watch good soccer players. If you want to be a good artist, you look at good paintings. If you want to be a good reader, you listen to good readers. And if kids are only hearing themselves read, uh, they probably don't hear that natural reading. It allows access to high interest materials because you can read anything to them. You know, when I read with first graders, you can call those books anything you want, but interesting is really not one of them because you know, I have a ball, I have a glove, I have a hat, not that exciting, but you can read anything to them. And that might be where they realize that, oh, reading is fun or reading is interesting or reading is valuable. And then allows them to focus on the content and the comprehension. Uh, as you saw with TROGS, if you're struggling with the decoding, you're not getting past that. But if you read to them, they can think about the topic. They can think about who the story is about. They can think about all that uh, higher level stuff. And so reading to them builds uh, those other pieces of the reading process. So lots of academic benefits. It's not just uh, babysitting. Does reading to a kid just mean they're gonna automatically know how to read? No, they need to learn uh, how to decode, but this is a huge part of it. Good picture, my first thought is, oh my gosh, they're sitting way too close. Another great picture, but my first thought is, oh, there, there are way too many of them in a room. We need some pictures of people reading to each other um, virtually, so I collect those this year. 
So just some tips for reading together with kids. So some tips for reading with kids. Ham it up, do the huffing and the puffing, make the voices, try to get it as far away from this as possible. Uh, so do all that stuff. You guys have so many cool points. You can make a total fool of yourself and you'll still be cool tomorrow. So show that uh, you can be animated when you read. Really important message to share. Uh, let the kids touch the book. Usually I say touch the book, turn the pages. I'm not sure how that translates online, but as much physical involvement and as they can with the story. Have a conversation about the book. Uh, just general conversation. And then ask questions, work on some comprehension. So you're doing the decoding. This is a perfect place to, uh, to ask questions. And two most important are what just happened and what do you think are gonna happen? But there are a gazillion possible comprehension questions that you can ask. Remember when you ask questions that there are teacher questions or tutor questions, and there are real questions. A teacher question is what's two plus two or what color is Curious George's hat? Or what do trogs grand? You know the question, answer to that. You're just checking up on the kids. Real questions are like, if you add up all the boys and your girls in your family, how many kids would there be? Or do you think Curious George should run away and join the circus? Or have you ever seen a trog? Uh, that's a real question. You don't know the answer to that until the kid tells you. So make sure that you ask a combination of those teacher questions and those real questions. I was working with a, a little girl and we were reading a story called To the Woods about a family going on vacation to the woods. And English wasn't her first language. So I wanted to make sure that she understood all the vocabulary. So I said, well, what does it mean to go to the woods? And she said, well, you know, it's like going up north. I said, yeah, that's, that's right. And uh, they, in the story, they wanted to, to see a moose, take a picture of a moose. And I said, well, what's a moose? And she said, well, it's like a big cow. I said, that's right. And then they had to cross a creek. And I said, well, what's a creek? And she said, well, it's like a little river. And I said, good. And she looked at me in complete seriousness and said, there are a lot of words you don't know. And uh, you know, I was asking teacher questions. She kind of pointed out to me. So go ahead and uh, ask those, uh, those real life questions. So let's look at the reading with kids strategies and we'll start with the echo reading. And what you do with echo reading is you read a sentence and the kid repeats what you've read. And then you read a sentence and the kid repeats what you're repeating or they're echo echoing what uh, you read. And so I need a volunteer who will help me do this activity. So if you could unmute yourself and say, I'll help you out. So how much fun Emily had, so here is your chance to help me. I can help you. Who is it, Anna? Anna? Yeah, yeah. Which one, Anna or Anna? Uh, whichever. <laughs> oh, I, called, I called Anna from Frozen Anna and I got in big trouble. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna read and then you're gonna repeat what I read out loud, okay? So we'll start, we're gonna use, uh, we're gonna do Alexander and the Horrible, Terrible, Very Bad Day. So let's start with the title. I'll read it and then I'd like you to repeat it. Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. All right, good. All right, now that was pretty easy for you because you could just read the text yourself, right? So we're gonna make it a little bit more realistic. So. I'm not going to show you the text. So I'm just going to read the first sentence and then I'll have you repeat back what I just read. Okay? Read the first sentence. I went to sleep with gum in my mouth and now there's gum in my hair. And when I got out of bed this morning, I tripped on my skateboard and by mistake, I dropped my sweater in the sink while the water was running. And I could tell it was going to be a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. Go ahead and repeat that. Is that a joke? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love that example because sentences can get really, really long. So what could I have done to make that easier for you? To break it down? Sure, break it down. So let's do it. I went to sleep with gum in my mouth. I went to sleep with gum in my mouth. And now there's gum in my hair. And now there's gum in my hair. 
And when I got out of bed this morning, and when I got out of bed this morning, I tripped on the skateboard. I tripped on the skateboard. And by mistake, and by mistake, I dropped my sweater in the sink. I dropped my sweater in the sink. While the water was running. While the water was running. And I could tell it was going to be a terrible. And I could tell it was going to be a terrible. Horrible. Horrible. No good. No good. Very bad day. Very bad day. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So again, that's echo reading. You read, the kid reads back. On uh, real life, they can look at the book. If they're not, don't make a big deal out of it. Don't say, you're not really reading. What's that word? Okay. Again, the trick is to break it down into uh, manageable chunks. Okay. It doesn't take too many words to become unmanageable. Okay. This one's nice because you can, uh, you can read really high level stuff and the kid can repeat back. And that's pretty exciting for them. I've seen students do it with college textbooks. And the, and the first graders are like, woohoo, I'm reading a college textbook, right? So it's a, a nice way to uh, communicate. So next activity is uh, called duet reading, paired reading, partner reading, neurological impress method, a lot of names for it, all pretty much the same activity. What you're going to do is you're going to read the story aloud together. And this one's interesting on Zoom because everybody can't be talking at the same time or the sound cuts out. So if you're doing this in person, you can all be talking out loud. If you're doing it on Zoom, you're probably gonna ask the kids to um, keep their microphones muted, but have their cameras on so that you can see. So we're gonna do this and I'll put the text on. Move your pictures so I can see it. So what I'm going to do is I am going to read this out loud, and then I am going to trust that all of you are going to read aloud with me. Okay. So on your mark, get set, go. I went to sleep with gum in my mouth, and now there's gum in my hair. And when I got out of bed this morning, I tripped on the skateboard. And by mistake, I dropped my sweater in the sink while the water was running. And I could tell it was going to be a terrible, horrible, very bad day. Very bad day. So again, you're gonna read aloud together. If the kid's a couple seconds behind you, works fine on uh, Zoom. Okay. So the big thing there is to help them increase their speed so they aren't reading Unlike the first one where you can read any text to them, this one, it has to be a little bit simpler reading material than they can, they can read through it. That is duet reading, paired reading. Next activity you can try is alternate reading. And this is where you take turns. So you read a sentence, the kid reads a sentence, you read a sentence, the kid reads a sentence, you read a sentence, the kid reads a sentence. Pretty straightforward. Um, I can send you away. That's one long sentence. So what do I got here? So I just have a passage here. Could I get another volunteer who will help me out with uh, alternate reading? are shy. So I just need someone to volunteer and might unmute themselves. <laughs> I got you, Rob. All right, who is it? This is Steven from Big Brothers nice. Big Sisters. Hi, Steven, thank you. Uh, so do you want to start or do you want me to start? Which would you I, prefer? I can start. Is it, okay. uh, are we switching off every sentence or every two sentences? That's a good one. What would you like to do? One sentence. All right, let you be the kid, you get the call. Go ahead, go. Oh my goodness. Juneteenth, a poor, <laughs> a portamantu of June and 19th, also known as Freedom Day, Jubilee Day, and Cell Liberation Day, is an American holiday celebrated on June 19th. It memorializes June 19th, 1865, when Union General Gordon Granger read orders in Galveston, Texas, 
that all previously enslaved people in Texas were free. Although the Emancipation Pro Pro Proclamation had formally freed them almost two and a half years ago, and the American Civil War had ended with the defeat of the Confederate States in April, Texas was the most remote of the slave states with low presence of Union troops, so enforcement of the proclamation had been slow and inconsistent. All right, thank you. And I let Stephen pick, so it was his fault that he got the long sentences and he got the sentences with the hard <laughs> words. And so I always let the kid pick who goes first. Uh, and I've had kids go, ha ha, you got the long sentence, let's keep reading. I'm like, okay, I'll play this game all day if you want to. Okay. It's also nice because kids will start looking for that end punctuation. Uh, sometimes they skip over the periods. Uh, here, it means I get to stop. So, so good activity. Next activity. Rob, do you know what that word is? The, the P word? I don't even know what that is. What is it? Portmanteau? Yeah, who's I don't. The, who's I don't a French know. major there? I, I mean, it's like, um, I'm not a French major, but I speak French. It's like where you would hang your um, coats. Yeah, okay. so like coat hanger. Yeah. Okay, right. it's, it's my word of the day. It is your word of the day. Look at the vocabulary a little bit. Uh, so we got those. So there we go, assisted reading. So assisted reading is where you have the kid read and when he needs help or she needs help, they need help, you jump in and help them. I'm sure you've all done this in some capacity. Uh, the hardest part I think is knowing when to jump in because I've certainly jumped in only to have the kid say, I would have gotten that. And then I've not jumped in only to have them say, I'm dying here, help me out. So it's the art of tutoring. It varies from kid to kid and from day to day. Uh, I think just some tips. One, you want to avoid the kid getting frustrated. So if they're getting frustrated, uh, just jump in and tell them what the word is. Uh, because, you know, learning, you got to push yourself. But if they push yourself too far, you get frustrated, you shut down. So when in doubt, help them out. Uh, another thing to do is um, really consider what's the purpose of reading this? If you are reading this so that the student can practice sounding out words, then give them time to practice sounding out words. If you're reading this because you want to learn about Juneteenth, then don't make them use brain cells on sounding out words. Just tell them what the word is and move on. So really consider the purpose of why you're reading. And then another tip is uh, just uh, come up with a signal. You know, tell the kid when I want you to read, and when you want my help, raise a finger. Preferably this one. They'll try others, but this one is the best. Or pull their ear or do whatever. When they do that, uh, that's your signal for jumping in and helping. So let them pick uh, pick the words. I did this with a, a little girl, and we were reading Jody, and she was gonna raise a finger. She's gonna pull her ear if she wanted my help. And so we got to about the third word, and she stumbled. And uh, I told her what it was, and she said, "I didn't pull my ear." I said, you're right, sorry, and read a little bit more. And again, she stumbled. Again, I told her what the word is. And this time she was not sweet. She's like, I did not pull my ear. And uh, I said, you're right, I'm sorry. And at the end of the story, I said, uh, Jody, how many times have you asked for help? And she got a big smile on her face and she said, none. And I said, you know what, you're right. And I'm sorry. And I want to apologize because I haven't let you be as good a reader as you can be. You know, because sometimes in our quest to help the kids, we do it for the kids and that's not helping. Either. So find that balance. It varies day to day. Um, just don't let them get frustrated. So additional thoughts about reading with and to the kids. You know, not all books or not all passages are created equal. Um, you know, some books are designed to be read by kids who are learning how to read, and some books are designed to be read by adults to those kids. So think about what's the purpose of this book? What's the purpose of the activity? And sure you make sure you match up the kid with the book with the activity. Uh, really, any book is accessible to any kid. If they want to read uh, War and Peace, then read it to them. Right? The big thing, don't ask the kids to read books that are above their reading level to you. 
So if they're reading at a second grade level and don't have them pick a fifth grade book, that's not gonna make them a better reader. It's gonna frustrate them. Um, so most times in schools, books are leveled or reading material is leveled and kids will know they're in level one, level B, level green, level banana, whatever that labeling system is. Um, if you don't have a book that's leveled or you don't know the level of the reading material, you can do the five finger test. So every time the kid is reading or have the kid read every time they miss a word, raise a finger. And if you get to five fingers on one page or a couple pages, that tells you that's way too hard a book for them to be reading themselves. Uh, maybe they're really interested in it, so stop and read it to them. If they have no fingers up, that's a great book for them to read to you because they can read more fluently and show you what a great reader they are. And then if there are a couple of fingers up, maybe you take turns reading or something. But again, make sure the kids are reading books that are at their level or even a little below their level if they're reading out loud to you. Uh, reading the same book over and over again is a good thing, really. I'm sorry, I know it's painful to read that same book 500 times. Uh, the kid isn't cheating, the kid is practicing. And so uh, curl your toes, grit your teeth, and uh, read the book again. One of my favorite pictures here is, uh, I love the look on the tutor's face, like, oh my gosh, must I drink this book? Because we've all been there. So uh, make that enthusiasm and recognize that the kid isn't cheating, they're, um, they're uh, practicing. And then you have to be bad before you can be good. You know, reading is a skill, it's something you do. And you don't start out good at a skill, you start out bad. And the way to get good is to not quit, right? And I know all of us have quit learning to do something because we got to the point where we weren't really good at it. And so we just quit. Violin, piano, banjo, Go ahead in the chat in the chat box. Share what you learned and you quit. So what did you give up that you were learning? It got hard, and so you just quit. For piano, because languages, piano and dance, gymnastics, beatboxing, sewing, violin. Cross, the splits, <laughs> good for you. Yeah, you know, the kids kind of want to give up on reading because it's tough. And so it's our job to really help them over that hump of wanting to quit. Uh, a couple ways to do it. One, don't set them up for failure. So pick materials, pick activities that they're going to be successful at. Tutoring should really be about success. And so uh, set them up for success. The other thing is, if they make mistakes, you don't always have to point it out to them. Um, you ever been to a kid's piano recital? They're terrible. But what do we say? Good job, right? You ever been to a kid's soccer game? Really pretty embarrassing. But what do we say? Great job. Keep trying. So it's our job as tutors to say, great job. Keep trying. Um, because we want to write them to write over them. And they're probably not going to make a mistake that's so bad that's going to destroy their learning how to read. So it's okay to look past the mistakes. All right. So we're going to switch topics now to vocabulary. And this is a huge thing that pops up when you're tutoring. Um, kids will run across words that they don't know, like trogs or granning or steg. And you need to sort of explain what that word means. And so we'll talk about a little, a couple ways to practice vocabulary with the kids. And we'll start with one I guarantee every tutor in the history of tutoring has done. And it's called, what does blank mean? And that is you're reading with the kids and they look at you and say, what does trogs mean? Or what does emancipation mean? Or what does whatever mean? And then you in the heat of the moment, uh, sometimes with people watching, have to come up with a definition of that word. Okay, so it's like, a, it's like a game show. So we're going to play a rollicking game of what does blank mean. And so first thing I, on the screen, I have put some vocabulary words. And I would like you just on a 
piece of paper somewhere to uh, pick 10 of the words and write them down. So don't just pick the first 10, but don't spend 20 minutes picking 10 words, but just pick any 10 words and write them down, a uh, piece of paper. And as you're doing that, I'll tell you what the activity is going to be. We're going to put you in breakout rooms and uh, give you 11 minutes to do this activity. Put the directions up here. And we're going to say that the oldest person in the group is going to go first. So you have to figure out uh, who is the oldest. And uh, the oldest person is going to pick a word from your list. And you're going to pick something, for example, I might look at Stephen and I'd say, Stephen, what does emancipation mean? And then Stephen, in the heat of the moment with everybody watching, is going to have to define what that word means to everyone's satisfaction. And then once he's done that, Stephen is going to pick a word and call on somebody in the group and ask them to define that word. And so you'll bounce around the group defining words until your time is up. The list back up. So go ahead, have Matt put you back in breakout rooms and again give you 11 minutes to do the activity and then we'll come back and talk about how it went. Thank you for doing that. Um, so what did you learn as you did this activity? Go ahead in the chat box, type sort of, what, what did you discover as you uh, did? What does blank mean? At first it was tough because like people would define it, but then I, oh, I guess I can type in the chat. You're, you're fine, keep talking. Oh, I said it was, it was tough because like, Sometimes we would define it, but then realize that like, if we were defining this in like a context with that, that, it, that is with like smaller children, it, the definition wouldn't work. So we had to like kind of change it up. Mm -hmm. Definitely context is, is key. All right, so lots of things, it's hard. I think that's the number one reason why I had you do it. It's hard and it's one of those things that jumps up and bites you because here's a word you know, here's a word that you use. But defining it for someone is surprisingly tough. And here you were defining it for other people who probably knew what the word meant, and it was tough. Imagine doing it with uh, kids who don't know what the word means. So it is a tough thing to do, so just a little caution. And uh, my first tip is first think and then speak, because the kid's not going to unlearn your really stupid first definition to relearn your better second definition. So I'll just say, let me think about how I'm going to define this to you. Especially if the kids are non-native English speakers, uh, you don't want to cram more English in their heads than uh, are absolutely necessary. Don't be afraid to say you don't know. This will come up. Kids will ask you, what does the word mean? Uh, it's okay to say you don't know. It happens a lot if you're doing like homework help training. Kids are like, what is a coordinate plane? I'm like, well, that's clearly a plane that you coordinate things on, right? Uh, don't feel like you have to make things up. Don't be afraid to say, I don't know. Don't say, I don't know. Say, I don't know, and this is what I do when I don't know a word. And what a powerful message that a college student, one, doesn't know what a word means, and it's okay, and two, has strategies to look it up. So go ahead and, and say you don't know, and then help them figure it out, figure it out together, I guess. Uh, teach it in context. Lots of words mean more than one thing. Most words mean more than and what you don't want to do is say, well, it means this, and it means this, and it means this, and it means this, not really rare occasions, it means this. Teach one meaning of the word and resist the urge to teach all the others. And if the kid asks you, doesn't it also mean this, then you can dig a little bit deeper, but teach one meaning and kind of ignore all the rest. And then pick your battles, how precise they need to be. Uh, 
Uh, sometimes you just say it means happy and moves on. So think about what's the what's the overall picture of what we're working on, what's the learning target of what we're working on, and you don't have to sit and describe every word in great detail. So what were some of the ways that you successfully defined the words? Go ahead in the chat box and type some of the strategies you used to define the words this morning, this afternoon, I guess. You gave examples, you came up with a simple word. What else? So synonyms, put it in a sentence, so recontextualizing it, that's great. You try to connect it to the person's life which is good. What else? All right. I got a list here. One, you come up with a synonym, a word that means the same. Uh, the trick there is to come up with an easier synonym than a harder synonym, and our name, our brains does not go there. Uh, and it's hard when you're working with littler kids because it's hard to come in over, under a pretty basic word. I was working with some preschoolers, and they said, uh, "What does brave mean?" I said, "Oh, it means courageous." Now, think before you speak, Rob. That did not help to get them the word courageous. That didn't help them understand it anymore. So come up with a synonym. Uh, sometimes people will say, how about coming up with an opposite? And that sometimes works. The problem I've seen is sometimes the kids have problems remembering, is this a word that means the same or a word that means different? So I usually stick with uh, synonyms, especially with younger kids. Uh, put it in a sentence. By doing that, uh, you contextualize it for the kid. Give an example. Here's an example of brave. Here's an example of whatever. You can draw it so you can give them a visual clue. You can act it out. Lots of zoom hand movements here as you're trying to uh, define a word. And then you might just give a definition. It means this. And I think what you'll find is that which strategy you use depends on the word. You'll probably stumble through a couple of them before you come up with the uh, the right one. And if you combine them all together, then that's uh, that's the ideal. When I did uh, the, um, what does brave mean? I said, it means courageous and that didn't help. So I said, well, it means not afraid of anything. And one of the kids said, oh, like Superman. So they came up with the example and um, said, yep, that's right. Uh, Part of my job is I do trainings for uh, offenders in the correctional facilities around Minnesota, and we were doing this activity, and they had the word dismal, and they called me over. We were in person. They called me over, and they said, dismal, does this mean little? I said, no, it's actually the prefix, dis, meaning against or bad, and uh, that didn't help. So I said, well, the weather's been really dismal, and since they were in prison, the weather wasn't the most relevant um, context. I said, well, the Minnesota Twins have been really dismal. And one of them said, oh, I mean, sucks. And I'm like, yep, yeah, that's, a, that's a synonym for it. And that's the one that stuck. So again, you might stumble your way into it. You can also do an activity called a vocabulary card that ties everything together. So we'll do this. So for this, you'll need a piece of scratch paper. And on your paper, if you could divide it into or like on the screen. And then in the upper left-hand box, you're gonna put the vocabulary word that you want the kid to learn or that you're working on with the kid. And we'll use a word that I had a real student ask me, and that is sassy. So I like to write the word sassy in the upper left-hand corner. And he said coming up with a sentence was a great way to teach the words. So in the box below, you're going to write a sentence using the word sassy. So I could say I like the word sassy, but that really doesn't help me understand the word. 
and I could say, John was sassy, but unless you know John, that might not help you understand the words. So you have to come up with a sentence that gives enough of the example that it provides some context. So go ahead in the chat box, if you've come up with a sentence using the word sassy, go ahead, type it in. So again, in the chat box, write a sentence using the word sassy. There we go. Got a couple of them. Again, they're good sentences because they give enough of an example that it helps you uh, understand it. All right, good. In the box in the bottom right hand corner, I would like you to write a word that means the same as sassy. A word that means the same as sassy. And then go ahead and type that word in the chat box. So synonym for sassy. So again, this shows why it's important to know the context of the word to begin with, because some of the synonyms are positive words, some of them are negative words. Um, so it helps to know where the kid heard it, saw it, read it, so that you can teach that meaning. Um, another thing that you can do and have you on the back of the card, I would like you to draw a picture of sassy. So draw a picture of sassy. Do your best work. We're going to post these online somewhere. When I work with uh, kids, this is their favorite part of the activity. They love drawing. When I work with adults, it's like, we hate you. And I won't make you show your drawings, everybody. But I trust you did great work. Uh, and again, here I'm being nice. I won't make you turn on your cameras, but I would like you to act out sassy. So I'm going to trust that for your benefit, the cat's benefit, you're going to act out sassy. Kids are really good at that one. And then with the remaining box on your card, I would like you to write a definition of the word sassy. So go ahead and then type the definition in the chat box. Definition of sassy. Being disrespectful and disrespectful in a witty manner, clever disrespect. Any other definitions?
So you have, oh, sorry, you have the word, you have the word in context, you have a definition of the word, you have a synonym for the word, you have a high quality drawing of the word, and you've acted it out. So it covered all your bases in one uh, nifty activity. Again, way better to teach, way better to teach a few words thoroughly than to just touch on a lot of different words. So uh, pick the words that are important for the kids and then spend the time teaching them well. Another way you can work on vocabulary is by doing it contextually. And what you'll find is a lot of times in textbooks or in any reading, the definition of the word is already there. The author has given it to the reader, uh, but sometimes the kids freak out, they see the word, they don't know what it is. And so they just, I don't know what this word means. Textbooks do this a lot. First grade textbooks do it a lot, college level textbooks do it a lot. And so the authors would just give lots of different uh, ways of defining the word, embedding it into the text. And I have some examples here. So here are some sentences. Vampire bats are a type of bat that feeds on the blood of other animals. Oh my gosh, I don't know what a vampire bat is. Okay. Well, it is a type of bat, oops, a type of bat that feeds on the blood of other animals. It's already contextualized in the sentence. So one of the things that you can do with the kids is help them find in the sentence where the definition is given. And so go ahead, the annotation feature should be uh, activated. So if you could click on view and draw and go ahead, use your annotation tool to underline, highlight, circle, whatever the uh, part in the sentence where the definition is given. I think if you go to view on the top, it will give you the annotation tool. All right, give you a couple seconds. The annotation tool, if you're using Zoom, is a great way to keep the kids physically involved with what they're reading. And so in doing underlining or highlighting works really well. Uh, earlier, we talked about chunking when you're reading, and you can have kids make marks where they think the chunk should be. So vampire bats are a type of bat that feeds on the blood of other animals. So with older kids who can um, read well enough to identify the chunks, you can have them physically use the annotation tool to, uh, to mark out those chunks. So they, get the, they can see where the breaks are. Let's see who's drawing. Let's say is just the different tiers of vocabulary. And we talk about tier one vocabulary, tier two, and tier three. Tier one vocabulary are uh, sort of conversational words, words that we use when we talk to each other, words that we use when we post on Facebook, uh, words that we use in informal email. Uh, chances are the kids know the meaning of these words. Uh, what they might not know is the fifth definition of the mean, like don't horse around, that might confuse them. But for the most part, kids know these words. Tier two words, sometimes called the specialized words, uh, academic word list, the reading word list, the power word list. 
These are words that we really only run across when we're reading, particularly more academic texts, or we only use when we're writing more academic things. And, um, you know, people say, oh, I use these words all the time. You probably don't talk to your friends and say, I have a significant amount of homework to do tonight. But when you're in a job interview, you say, I have a significant amount of experience and you should hire me. So um, these are kind of the, the power vocabulary, the academic vocabulary. These are words that kids often don't know because they're not reading a lot or they're not reading academic texts. And then tier three words are the technical words. Words are gonna come across in a science textbook, a history textbook. Um, these are really important if you're doing homework help type of activities. But in general, the most important words to work on are those tier two vocabulary words, because those are the ones that kids are going to run across um, the most. And so spend your time helping them really understanding those words and look for every opportunity you can to use those words when you're talking to the kids. Um, when I was working with the preschoolers, they would do morning meeting where they went around and talked about how are they today and the kids were either good, bad, super good or super bad. So I would always try to find a tier two word to define how I was. So one day I said I was disgusted because the weather was really bad. And the kids sort of didn't react and I didn't think they paid attention. And when I went to tutor the next week, the teachers were all laughing because the kids were telling everyone that I was disgusting. Like, no, different form of the word, but at least uh, they were paying attention. So look for opportunities to expose them to those tier two words. Okay, moving on. I'm going to talk about alphabetics, and it's just crazy to spend so little time talking about alphabetics, but uh, getting into too great detail would really open up a can of worms. And I think you'll probably be given a whole lot of resources at your tutoring location to teach these skills. You'll be given a phonics book to work on. You'll be given some uh, materials to use to practice these skills. And it really is important that you align what you do with the kids to what's happening in the classroom for these. Uh, the way you understand how to sound out a word might be different from the way the kid understands how to sound out a word. So I'm just gonna breeze through these quickly and sort of trust that you'll be getting resources from uh, your program or I can come back and do another training on alphabetic strategies at another time. Sometimes they're called the decoding strategies. Sometimes they're called word study strategies. You'll see these terms all used. They're all the same. Whatever you call them, I tend to call them games. Yay, we're going to play some games to practice our alphabetic skills. So just going to quickly go through these. Um, letter recognition, so knowing your ABCs. It is a kindergarten reading grade level expectation, meaning at the end of kindergarten, all kids should know the letters. On reality, we hope kids get to kindergarten already knowing the letters. Some do, some don't. Um, most have some, but lots of activities you can do. Keyboarding is great because to be able to type, you have to find the B and you have to find the D. And so just having to use the keyboard is a great way to help kids identify the letters. Uh, here they put up the letters in the classroom. The kids can find them. Uh, here they have little foam letters that they can play with. Magnetic letters. Um, one of the first academic computer games I ever played back when computers were new, and as a kid, computers were new, was a game called Letter Blaster, where you just had to shoot all the Bs or shoot all the Ts or stuff like that. So lots of online games to practice letter identification. Not the officially sanctioned use of the Os, but that was fun. Um, and here, can you pick out the tutor in that lineup? They did some spelling. After letter recognition, letter formation. So making letters out of Play-Doh, out of um, shaving cream out of wiki sticks, whatever, just so the kids can focus on the shape. If we are in person, we'd be playing in Play-Doh right now. That's one of the great casualties of COVID. Sight reading, memorizing the words as pictures. So the kids uh, just quickly identify the without having to sound it out. And uh, so here are some flashcards. Kids can do matching activities. They can do drag and drop. There are all kinds of activities they can do virtually. 
Here they're playing a game called SWAT where they hit, the, the tutor says a word like the, and they hit the word with uh, the, the fly swatter. They can do it online where they're given a word, they have to go and circle it on the screen. <laughs> and then the whole sounding out business, which has two parts, phonological awareness, which is hearing and manipulating the sounds, and then phonics, which is tying the sounds and letters together. Yeah, again, physical, if it involves pain, they're gonna, it's a good activity. So what I will do is I will send um, Ruth some handouts with some phonics activities and some alphabetics activities along with some websites. Again, I trust that the site you work with will give you resources, either websites to use, computer games to use, whatever, to practice whatever skills. So I know I went, blew, blew through it pretty quickly, but that was intentional because I wanted to leave time to talk about the last skill, which is writing. And the teachers I've worked with have been pleased, look for opportunities to help the kids practice their writing skills. Because uh, it's a tough skill. So the last of our reading skills to develop, listening, speaking, reading, writing, you're done learning how to read by fifth grade. When you're done learning how to write, you're probably all working on getting better at writing your entire life. So writing's a tough skill. It's also a skill that uh, people have a lot of anxiety about. Talk about fear of writing. And you'll see first graders are already petrified at having to write anything. So you want to really focus on writing with the kids. Here's my overarching tip for any writing that you do. Uh, when helping the kids with writing, have them tell you what they're going to write before they write it. So before they write anything down on paper, have them tell you what they're going to say. That way they'll come up with the content and then you can worry about the spelling. This works with preschoolers, this works with college students. It's like, tell me what you wanna write. And then once you've helped them generate the thought, they can get it down on paper. And I'm gonna tell my, my second favorite tutoring story of all times here. I was helping out in a first grade classroom in Minneapolis Bancroft School. And the kids had a writing assignment. They were supposed to write a letter to someone, didn't matter to whom, just had to say, dear, the person's name, uh, three sentences, and then sincerely the kid's name. And three quarters of class wrote to the gym teacher, which I was fascinated by. A couple wrote to the classroom teacher, a couple wrote to their parents. There was one little boy, Frankie, who wanted to write to Michelle, who was a little girl who was on the other side of the classroom. And so uh, I walked up, I said, how's it going? He said, what do I write? I said, I don't know. What do you want to say to Michelle? He said, how about, I like that you are my friend. I said, that's cool. So he wrote that down. I went off and helped some other kid. Uh, came back later. Frankie's sitting there staring at the wall. I said, how's it going? He said, now what do I write? I said, I don't know. What do you want to say to Michelle? He said, how about, I hope you're my friend forever. I said, that's nice. So he wrote that down. Went off and helped some other kid. Came back. Frankie's staring at the wall. I said, how's it going? He said, now what do I write? I said, I don't know. What do you want to say to Michelle? He said, uh, how about having you for a friend is really, really fun. And I said, well, that's cool. But you said friend in the first two sentences. You think of something different for the last sentence. And he looked at me and he said, I love you. And that was funny enough, but uh, there's a little boy sitting next to us. And Frankie said that the little boy grabbed his arm and said, dude, don't take it to that level. I thought, dude, that's not the last time you're going to get that piece of advice. But uh, Frankie never asked me how to spell a single word. What he wanted help with is what am I going to write? And I'm sure as you sit facing having to write papers, the big challenge is what do I write about, not how do I spell the word. So help them think through how they're going to write. At the end of the class, Frankie grappled up his lever and shoved it in his desk. So I guess he wasn't ready to take it to the next level. Yep. Another activity that you can do is called close, and that is spelled correctly. It's short for closure, and it's just fill in the blank. So we got some here. Uh, the boy was paddling his, go ahead and type in the chat box what you think should be in the blank. People are awake. So the paddleboard, canoe, canoe, kayak. Not that many options. Okay. Let's try another one. In winter, it is snowy, cold, dark, slippery.
Time for ice hockey. There's an optimist there. And we'll do one more here. I like to eat, oops, sorry, most open-ended there. I like to eat pizza, but what, what else do you have? Fruit and nuts, breakfast, ice cream. Bad activity to do over lunch. Boiled cabbage. So a closed activity could be there's one, a couple logical answers, more answers, sky's the limit. For writing assignment, that last one is probably the, uh, the best. Here's one. Uh, if I had a superpower, and he said he would love to have x-ray vision, which is a good superpower. In preparation for running across this question, which seems to pop up in like every textbook, I would like you to write what superpower you would like to have in the checkbox. And you can't put the superpower to have all superpowers. That is cheating. So what would be your superpower? <laughs> Lots of good ones. Never get tired, that's a college student speaking. Languages, that's cool. I had a tutor share that she does a variation of this activity rather than sharing what superpower the kids would like. She has the kids share what superpower they already have. Like I have the superpower to help my mom with dishes or I have the superpower to make my little sister laugh. In the chat box, I would like you to share what superpower you already have. Multitasking, good for a college student. <laughs> Black girl magic, listening. Oh, Steven's using his superpower for good here. So this one's really nice because you know you're paired up with the kids because they're struggling academically, but they're not just you know kids who struggle with reading. They have all kinds of other strengths, and so look for every opportunity to uh, to bring those in. That's a pops up. Seen a tutor. And you can do stories and uh, we won't do this today, but when you're working with kids, you can find these online, just type in Mad Libs or closed stories and the kids can create a story by filling in the blank. So you can do it sentence by sentence or you can do an entire story. I wanna share what was the most popular writing activity when I asked the uh, kids in our summer program or tutors in our summer program, what they like to do with the students. And uh, their, the kid's favorite activity was this, and I was surprised by it. It's a writing activity. And I'll give you an example. A while back, I was doing this training in person for community members, and a woman came with her daughter who was three or four. Babysitter got sick. She didn't want to miss the training, so she brought her daughter, which was awesome. We sent her daughter in the back of the room and gave her pen, paper and pencil, and she wrote furiously. And on break, I asked if I could see what she was writing. And she said, yep. And she gave me permission to share it. And there it is. Okay, that's what she had written. You know, kids are phenomenal authors in that they have wonderful stories to tell. Unfortunately, they lack the mechanical skills to do it. Um, so they write this down and we're like, oh, that's great, honey, but you know, you spelled a third word wrong and you forgot the comma and that's not the correct use of the semicolon. And they're like, ooh, fear of writing, I don't wanna write anymore. So writing is the ultimate, you gotta be bad before you can be good skill and your badness is there for everybody to see. So when you're working on writing with the kids, I would focus on what is good and that is the content. So I just said, uh, tell me what your story is about. And it's about her mom and dad going shopping at the Mall of America, which is a, Mall of America is a common writing topic. I didn't say read what you wrote because she couldn't read it any more than I could. So I said, you know, you like to write. So why don't you go, when you go home, sit down with your mom, 
you tell her the story okay? and then um, have her write it down. You tell her the story out loud and have her write it down. And she gave me this look like, I don't know what you're talking about. And they went off. And uh, I ran into her mom actually a couple months later. I said, how's your daughter? And she smiled and she said, you have created a monster. And I said, how? And she said, oh, she comes to me and say, come here, mom, I want to write now. Come you lowly scribe. So you write, or the kid tells you the story and you write it down. And this is a great one to do virtually. You can do this over Zoom. Uh, they tell you the story out loud and then you type it for them. And that way they can totally focus on the content and not have to worry about what words do they know how to spell. And it's sort of like if you read to the kids, they have access to any book on the planet because they don't have to decode it to themselves. themselves. If you uh, scribe for them, then they can write anything that they want. They're not limited to what they know how to spell. So really, really great activity. So they write, or excuse me, they tell you a story and you write it down. Okay. Your time, and we are very close to being out of time. So what I'm gonna have you do is I'm gonna just in the chat box, I'm not gonna have you break into groups. I would like you to type in one tip you have for working with kids that we haven't talked about in the training today. So it could be a way to mo motivate them. It could be a behavior management strategy. It could be a fun game that you've played with the kids. So just whatever you can think of, go ahead and type it in the chat box. Your tip for sharing with kids, working with kids. <clears throat> Humor is good. Lots of people online reading, so you can find books being read out loud by all kinds of famous and infamous, not famous people. Humor. What else do you have? Bribery, <laughs> you can do, you, you don't have enough cool points to get them to do it on their own. So uh, you have to do bribery, be high energy. I know the last thing you wanna do is go to a tutoring session, trust me, but you know, once you get there, you wanna be the one that's uh, providing the energy, that's great. What other tips do you have? Either activity ideas, ways to keep them motivated. We have checking to see who's awake. Keep them moving, physically moving, which is harder to do online. Being patient and understanding. Again, make tutoring about success. Use their friends as peers. Structure, yeah, kids love structure. They wanna know what's gonna happen first, what's gonna happen second. Uh, they'll remind me, I'm like, what are we supposed to do next? And they'll tell me, don't be afraid to get silly. If I can dress up like a crayon, you can do, you can be silly. You guys have a lot of great ideas and I would, you know, trust your instincts, uh, talk to each other, get ideas from each other, that's valuable. Uh, the programs that you work with, you'll have teachers and you'll have staff that can provide you with resources and ideas if you get stuck. Okay. The internet has tons of activities. Um, how do you teach whatever? And they'll come up with lots of different things that you can uh, borrow and use. And if you ever get stuck, just ask the kids because it's their job. They're, they're learners all the time. And so they know what they're supposed to do. And I'll just end with a story. I had I was working in the classroom and I walked in, the teacher gave me a group of 10 kids in the bag of a hundred flashcards. He wanted me to review the flashcards. And so I sat down with the kids and I said, uh, how are we supposed to do this? And one of them rolled their eyes and said, what you're supposed to do is hold up the word, ask us what it is. If we get the word, we get to hold on to whatever gets the worst, the most words wins. Like, you idiot, everybody knows how to do this. And so we did this a couple of times around the circle and they said, this is boring. I said, okay, how can we make it more interesting? They said, how about we have to use a word in a sentence? And if it's a good sentence, we get the word. Like, sounds good. So we did it a couple of times around. They said, this is still boring. I said, okay, how can we make it more interesting? They said, how about 
we have to use a word in the sentence and you have to tell us if the sentence is true. I really had no idea what they were talking about, but the first word was mother. And they said, my mother is 32. I'm like, true. And they're like, nope, she's 33. I get the card. Uh, they like this activity. They stumped me on every single word. We got through the whole bag. They counted up the word. And then they said the thing no tutor wants to hear, which is let's play again. But again, they had the buy-in, let them decide how you're gonna do the action activity, what activities you should do. See, Ruth is popping up, which means my time is out. I wanna end with uh, saying thank you. Um, and I think saying thank you for tutoring is like when they say thank you at Dairy Queen for buying ice cream, because the kids are really good at saying thank you by being happy when you show up, by being happy or being sad when you leave. Um, and sometimes I do formal thank yous. I just want to end with some that I got from second graders. Right, here's them dogpiling me. So that's a nice way to say thank you. Uh, but here's one I got. Dear Rob, you are nice. Thank you for working with us. Have a nice week. Yours truly, Sarah. So go Rob. And my coworkers give me a go Rob. So thanks to Sarah there. And then, uh, dear Rob, I will miss you because I will not be here. I'm going to move. Yours truly, Edwin. If any of you are philosophy majors or logic majors, this will keep you up tonight. And then here's my favorite. Uh, you're the nicest man that we ever met and I'm going to miss you, Rob, and I feel bad for you. So nothing at Hallmark comes close uh, to that sentiment. And even if you never get the formal thank yous, you get that, which is all I think most of us are looking for, that smile of appreciation. So I'll let the kids say thank you for tutoring. I'll say thank you for being at the workshop today and participating. And I'll pass it back to uh, Ruth and Eileen. Um, thank you so much, Rob. What a gift it is to be able to interact with you in this way. Um, I've had an opportunity to see the ABCs of tutoring and participate a while now. And um, this was just such a delight today. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you sharing your wisdom with us, especially knowing that um, your role has transitioned and um, that it was a true gift for you to decide to come back and figure out a way to do this remotely with us today. We are so, so grateful. Thank you.